my name is Tanya Hertz, and I am the executive director at the Rec Innovation Lab at San Diego Miramar College. And I am very happy today to welcome our guest presenter, Mona Patel, who's going to be talking to us a little bit about how you can leverage your interests, your hobbies, your passions, your values to uh, ensure that your career aligns with those, uh, those internal characteristics. Uh, we'll be looking at how the, the great resignation, the trend in the job market has, um, has really shifted so that people are, uh, are leaving their current positions that are unfulfilling to find jobs that, that are, um, are much better aligned with their internal characteristics. So um, with that, I will uh, pass it on to Mona and, um, Thank you for being here with us today, Mona. So I just wanted to bring it to, um, you know, today to talk about this topic that maybe might be of interest to you. Um, so I'll get more into the conversation about what pro portfolio careers are later in my presentation, but I'm going to start more with introducing myself first and getting a chance to kind of have you do sort of like some self-reflection. So I will, next slide, please. So I wanted to go ahead and introduce myself. So by titles, job titles, um, my I have three roles, career center coordinator, career counselor, and an associate professor. So my day-to-day -day, um, tasks primarily include overseeing the career center at Miramar College. And I lead a team of counselors, um, a student assistant, and a couple of project assistants that are part-time employees. And our main role is to help students um, in terms of building their professional skills. And this could be anything from helping students with their resumes, cover letters, um, helping students search for internships, um, part-time jobs, full-time work, um, helping students engage with employers. So there might be certain employers that students are interested in connecting with. And then also um, helping with networking and mock interview type of um, practice, because we all know that these are not skills that we build overnight, but it takes quite a bit of practice to get to a point where you start feeling a little bit more comfortable and confident through that process. So um, that's what I do at Miramar College and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And outside of work, I am a mom. I have a four-year-old son and my background, I'm South Asian. So my parents are from India. I was born here in the United States. Um, they immigrated to the United States in the early 1970s. Um, and I think, you know, that why I'm telling you a little bit about who I am outside of my job titles is because I think that your culture and other parts of your identity impact how you work and the messages that you receive. Um, and so that's something that I find is important that, that I'd like to share with you. And then lastly, just for fun and something that I'm proud of is that I'm a geriatric millennial. So I was born in the early 1980s and um, there's a lot of articles on geriatric millennials and how we are basically the bridge for um, a lot of different generational differences because we understand the world that was pre-technology so the pre-TikTok, pre-YouTube, pre-smartphones, -pre um, pre-dial-up even. <laughs> and we also understand the world of when it became, you know, such like, you know, having the cell phones and everything like picked up. So um, I Mona, think I've had... Oh, sorry, sorry I, didn't pick it off. I never heard that term before. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Well, there's an article that said, you know, if we are the future, then at least give us a better name, right? Because it's like geriatric millennial makes us sound so old. But you know what? I, I take it as wisdom and something that's positive. Yeah. Um, it seems so, a little pejorative, but I love it. I love it. That's funny. Yeah. So how we approach the world of work and um, how we identify in terms of like just workplace norms, I think put this sort of in a unique opportunity because I totally get like Gen Z's and some of the changes and the shifts that are happening um, with the culture, but I'm also more, you know, I get the traditional perspectives um, that have happened from, you know, the messaging that the Gen X or the baby boomers have received. So um, just a little bit about myself, next slide. 
So a lot of us, if you think back to your childhood, were asked this question, and it could have happened at school, it could have happened at home, your parents, your teachers, but I want you to take a moment to reflect on this question, a very traditional question that has, you know, been asked, um, I don't know the roots behind, you know, when it was first being, you know, a common to ask this question, but the question is, what do you want to be when you grow up? So take a moment to reflect on your earliest memory, if you can recall, of when you were asked this question or potentially, you know, the earliest memory you have of what you, how you answered this question. So just take a moment to think about it. Okay, so now um, I want to see if anyone would like to share um, either in the chat or you can um, share with, you know, audio, you can um, unmute yourself as to what would be something that came up in terms of your earliest memories of this question. Okay. So, uh, so you want us to answer what our earliest uh, memory was of, of the answer to this question? Yes. What, we what want do you want to be up. when you grow up? Yes. See one so far in the chat, somebody wanted to be an inventor. I know a, a, a marine biologist, a, a zoologist. Mm -hmm. um, I know for me, I remember my earliest memory was I wanted to be a lawyer. I just loved the way that they dressed up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone else? Veterinarian, public servant. Oh yeah, I see my chat, yeah. Teacher. Teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are great. Thank you for sharing. So I think my earliest memory was art teacher because art was my favorite um, class in kindergarten and or favorite, I guess it wasn't really a class, but like a favorite time of the day of whatever subject was being taught. And um, so obviously anything that was like creative and didn't have a lot of like structure, like math or a lesson plan, but it was more like, here's some free time for you to kind of explore. So I remember identifying with art quite a bit and teacher, I just saw it as like a helping type of a helping skill. So, um, so I see peace, officer, band, um, doctor. So this is all um, wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Um, next slide. So in recent times, there have been a lot of studies and articles showing that this isn't really the best way to ask um, children or just, you know, youth in general about who they want to be or what they want to be when they grow up. And I think that some of you, now that you've had some time to think about this question, can, as adults, be able to think as to what could be um, another way of approaching this type of dialogue, of having people think about their future career or careers, um, so in the chat, if you have another idea, rather than asking, what do you want to be when you grow up? What's another way that you think, or how, what do you wish that somebody would have asked you instead? And there's no right or wrong answers here. Maybe like, are you willing to commit? Because I feel like there's a lot of things that we want to do, like in terms of our dreams and our goals. But, um, you know, I feel like it wasn't until I got older, I realized that, you know, to actually pursue these things, we need to actually really focus in on this type of things. So I know that's like a kind of intense question to ask a, a child, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's something that you could teach a kid yeah, from a young age. 
Yeah, absolutely. And then um, thank you for sharing, Jacoby. And then I see a lot, uh, some other questions, um, examples. So what career goals do you hope to accomplish? What do you think will make you happy when you grow up? What problems in the world would you like to solve? Yes, Joan, that one's a common one that I, it's the rephrasing that I've seen come up quite a bit. Um, what are you interested in and why? These are all excellent examples. Um, what does the daily routine look like in that profession? Yeah, so let's go to the next slide. So Adam Grant is a psychologist and there was a New York Times article written that some of you may remember. Um, basically, it was talking about this question of what do you want to be when you grow up? And just the idea of how it's presented in our early stages of life and the messaging behind it, how it can put um, not only pressure on, you know, young children, but also this notion that you have to choose just this one career path. And there's so much pressure to have it identified at an early age. And so I apologize that it's very um, wordy, but I really wanted to capture um, some key points that were in this article. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and share it and you can also follow along. So the first point is, um, that Adam expressed this, my first beef with this question is that it forces kids to define themselves in terms of work. When you're asked what you want to be when you grow up, it's not socially acceptable to say a father or a mother, let alone a person of integrity. This might be one of the reasons many parents say their most important value for their children is to care about others, yet their kids believe that top value is success. When we define ourselves by our jobs, our worth depends on what we achieve. And then the next point that he brought up is the second problem is the implication that there is one calling out there for everyone. Although having a calling can be a source of joy, research shows that searching for one leaves students feeling lost and confused. And even if you're lucky enough to stumble onto a calling, it might not be a viable career. So I want you to take a moment to reflect on those two points um, with this in connection to that question of what do you want to be when you grow up? And as you reflect, I'm curious, do you identify or do you um, find that you agree with Adam's um, two points. Do any of you feel that there was pressure that you experienced growing up where you had to choose that one perfect career or that one perfect major. And there was just so much noise and whether it was from family influence or just societal or high school, you know, when you're deciding what you're going to do after high school, can anyone recall um, feeling or identifying with some of this? And I see in the chat that, yes, too much pressure. Okay, so we can go on to the next slide. So we can all agree that we are multifaceted creatures with multiple interests. So this notion of trying to choose that one career or that one major, um, the messaging that just society puts on us through either counselors or parents and just individuals, um, it doesn't align with the reality of the world of work and what's really happening. And so, um, and there's, there are a couple of chat messages I just wanted to look before I move on. So um, it's going to a different job every day, trash, truck driver, race driver, and what else? Okay, there was a definitely a lot of competition. Yes, definitely the competition of having, you know, it seems like everyone else around you 
has it together and you yourself, if you don't identify um, or have that one specific career path or major figured out, then you internalize as it's you, something is wrong with you. When in reality, all of us are probably facing the uncertainty um, when it comes to that pressure of choosing one. So with that idea of, you know, how we are made up of many different interests, and maybe there isn't just one specific path or one calling for majority of us. Um, I'd like for us to take a moment to think about, you know, how, how are we made up in terms of our identities? And so I'll share an example of myself and then I'll have some, allow you some time to think about you. Uh, next slide, please. So when I think about you know, everything from kindergarten up until, you know, my end of my master's degree. So I have, you know, I went through the K through 12 public school experience. Then I have my bachelor's degree in sociology and textiles and clothing. And then I have my master's in career counseling. And just within all of those areas as an undergrad, I faced a very challenging time in those four years of having to figure out just one, or when I heard about double major, that was overwhelming too, but it felt like for somebody who has a lot of interests, how do you, like, I, I changed my major three times, but, and then eventually chose my top two where I felt most interested in. But on top of that, there was a lot of influence based on my culture and my family and just pressure everywhere in terms of figuring out, um, you know, what was acceptable and you know, having time to reflect on all of this was overwhelming. But when I look back at just all of my interests and these have pretty much stayed um, consistent, uh, it would be sociology, psychology, business, um, history, art, fashion, cultural studies, teaching, counseling. And I always had a hard time thinking about what career aligns with all of those areas. There isn't one career that's going to align with everything that I'm interested in. And so, you know, one day if you asked me, I would say, yeah, I want to be a counselor. Another day I would, I would say, I want to be, you know, uh, an entrepreneur, a small business owner. Um, there was a time when I wanted to be a historian. And so it was evolving based on, you know, the types of classes I was taking. And I had a really hard time committing to one specific path and having focus. Um, and then on top of your subjects that you study that are interesting to you, you have your own personal interests, hobbies, um, causes that you care about. So for me, like travel, learning about different cultures, um, meeting people from different backgrounds, like I, that was important. I didn't know exactly like what that meant in terms of a career, but like to me, I need that. And I knowledge is very important. I love to read and stay current with trends of what's happening in the world or reading autobiographies, reading about history. And then my creative side, I love calligraphy. So um, I, I don't do it as much anymore, but I used to write um, like wedding cards for my friends. So I would do the calligraphy and I felt, I never thought of it as being like a side business, but I thought, well, that might be an opportunity to kind of, you know, not something that I felt like I would make a lot of money, but more for my own therapy and doing something fun outside of my day-to-day -day work. And then um, genealogy, I don't know if anyone watches the PBS show, Finding Your Roots, but I love that stuff. I love learning about history and our ancestors and stories and just how we all arrived in different ways to the United States. Um, it's just so fascinating to me. And then my own personal um, value with animal rights, and I'm a vegetarian, I was born and raised a vegetarian. It's something that um, has been part of my culture and my parents. And I have passed that on to my son as well. And so like, I love supporting small businesses that are plant based, um, like local vegan restaurants. And so that's something also that I care about. And then my core values, our creativity, freedom, flexibility, and um, providing service to others being, you know, helpful in some way that I see value in the work that I'm doing that I'm directly connected to it in that way. 
so we're multifaceted, multi, you know, there's all of these different, it's very complex, right? It's hard to translate all of this into one or two majors or one or two like careers um, because, you know, we have so many things that fulfill us and it's hard to put, you know, just one or two of these and align it with a career or a job. Um, and you're not going to find that you like everything about your job, but it helps to have a lot of these um, values and interests that align with what you're doing and spending most of your time on. And so now I would like to move to the next slide and give you some time to reflect on your favorite subjects when you look back or even currently if you're a student, you know, what do you enjoy or what have you enjoyed? Um, what are your interests? hobbies, and then your core values. What's really important to you in terms of not just work, but life too. I'm going to give you a couple of um, maybe two minutes to, you can either jot it down um, or you can think about it, but I want you to really take a moment to reflect on these three areas of your favorite subjects, um, what are you interested in? Where do you like to, like, maybe in your free time, what do you like to read up on or watch or talk about? Um, maybe certain values that you have. Mona, would it be okay if we went back to the slide where you shared your subjects, interests, sure. and values? Absolutely. But please don't let that influence what you No, I just wanted to see. You know, <laughs> no, 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 yeah, I yeah. love this. I mean, this gives so much more than a standard, you know, the standard test that we do. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah. take a moment to just, you know, quietly reflect on it for yourself. And again, no right or wrong answers, but just for you to think about. Yeah. Oh, and Patrick, you can go forward to the next slide. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm not going to ask everybody <laughs> to share, but I wanted to take a moment to remind all of you that at times when you feel overwhelmed, um, this is a really easy exercise in terms of just breaking it down into these three areas where, you know, what really gets you excited and what comes naturally to you and what is something that, you know, is meaningful, whether it's, you know, um, something that you're seeking in an ideal work setting or your lifestyle. Um, I know we can't always be picky and choosy about everything. But if you have a good core understanding of what your values and interests and what really makes you excited, then you're more likely to attract those types of um, classes, those types of you know, job opportunities, those types of internships. And you also align what's really important to you when you're, for example, interviewing for a position. Um, when you are seeking work, you are also, they're not just interviewing you, but you are also interviewing them. And so these are all great reminders of what um, is 
important in terms of your day-to-day, -day, how you seek uh, your ideal um, future career decisions. And I see a couple of you have shared your uh, subjects, interests and core values. So thank you for sharing those. Does anybody else wanna share them? Um, you can unmute yourself or just how this exercise, is, is it something you've done before or um, was, it some, was it helpful? Yes, yeah, so some of my subjects I like, I always like history, um, astron astronomy, art, marketing, like marketing in terms of like branding and uh, strategies or even like sales strategies. And when it comes to my interests, I always like traveling. I love music, art. I like new technology. So like something that Elon Musk is doing or Jeff Bezos is doing, that's something that has always been interesting to me. Just something that's something innovative. I like big innovative things. And then also, I don't know if you watch like the Joe Rogan podcast, but there's like a thousand different subjects on that. And that's just, I'd like to know about a bunch of different things. And then also I'm very uh, spiritual and I like to learn about different cultures. And then in terms of my core values, I think they're pr pretty similar to yours. Um, I like creativity. Uh, I'm, I'm big on creativity, having freedom, and um, also just, you know, being able to make a difference in other people's life. So, you know, service. So that pretty much matches mine to a T when it comes to core values. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Jacoby. We may have been related in our past lives. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, anyone else want to share before we move on to the next slide? Well, we have a lot in the in the chat. Business, biology, art, cultures. Um, that's this is crystals. Exploration, art, painting, movies, core values is creativity, self-choice, adaptive, adaptable. Gabby said science, English, travel, fashion, sports, creativity, freedom. Uh, Dawn said art, his, art in history, hobby, sketching, and fashion, core values, freedom, cre freedom, creativity, and honesty. Elijah said, um, yeah, this is a new one for him, but it really got him thinking. So that's good. Really helped me think about where I want to go in the future. So that's mm -hmm. good to hear. So this is actually very common for people, especially those of you who are, you know, interested in being an entrepreneur currently are, you know, looking at areas within business um, is we don't necessarily identify hundred percent with entrepreneurship or business. We, a lot of us have these other side hobbies and interests that somehow align with. Um, and so it's natural for a lot of us to be attracted when we have so many different interests, rather than finding um, a very narrow area that limits us. And so now we can go on to the next slide. So I do want to share with you, um, before we move into the portfolio careers, which is exactly what we're talking about today, a brief video that showing the trends of why Americans are quitting their jobs. And I want you to take, a, you know, as you listen to it, I don't want you to kind of reflect on the conversation of everything from the messaging that we've received from our childhood of what do you want to be when you grow up, that one calling or that one perfect major that you're supposed to find. And what's happened in the past 19 months with the pandemic, with so many people quitting their jobs, people reflecting on what their core values are, what's important. Some of it, of, of course, was inevitable due to, you know, layoffs or just circumstances of the industries being impacted. But as you watch this, I kind of want you to uh, take a moment to think about all of that. The Labor Department reported this week a stunning number of Americans quit their jobs in the month of August. The same report showed nearly 10 and a half million jobs remained open through that month. So why are workers leaving their jobs in droves and not taking the millions of new ones available to them? Economists point to a number of factors, including a reassessment during the pandemic by Americans who want more from their work. NBC's senior business correspondent, Stephanie Rule, has our Sunday focus. This week, 10,000 workers at agriculture equipment manufacturer Deere & Company made their voices heard. The cheap labor bubble is finally busted. John Deere says it's committed to resolve the dispute with a favorable outcome for their employees. 
It's the first strike for the United Auto Workers Union in 35 years, and just the latest in a string of labor actions across the country. More than 24,000 employees at healthcare provider Kaiser Permanente have voted to authorize a strike. Food giant Nabisco recently agreed to terms with its employees as more than 1,000 workers at cereal maker Kellogg began their own strike. With more disputes looming across other industries, some are calling this month Striketober. Our future is not for sale. Demands across the board are similar. Better wages, better and safer working conditions. We are seeing employers break out the same playbook where they're trying to offer uh, bonuses or new perks to try to attract workers. Workers are emboldened. They have more leverage as companies continue to struggle to hire enough employees. There are 50% more job openings today than pre-pandemic. And this intersects with another phenomenon, the Great Resignation. A record-breaking 4.3 million Americans quit their jobs in August alone, a 242,000 jump from July and a 1.3 million jump from a year ago. With extended COVID unemployment benefits run out, workers are defying the experts who predicted a return to the workforce, with many choosing to walk away, even without a safety net. And normally, we see quits rise when the labor market is hot, because that's when workers are best able to find other opportunities, or at least they feel confident in leaving their job currently, uh, because they know that another opportunity is just around the corner. Low-wage industries like retail, food service, and healthcare, some of the hardest hit. I think this last year and a half has really challenged us to look differently uh, at the people aspect of business, really place the value in them. Individual employees are motivated by many of the same things driving strikes. Better pay, better child care, more flexibility, and safer conditions. We definitely are seeing more employers actually acquiesce to worker demands because they know that right now it's a very tough situation in terms of being able to hire and retain talent. Bottom line, employees want to be heard. And more and more, they are. And Stephanie joins me now live. Steph, good morning. Great to see you. These strikes and quits point to an employee market. So how much of this has to do with the pandemic? What's the consensus, the working theory about why all this is happening now? Willie, this is all about the pandemic, and we shouldn't be surprised. Historically speaking, traumatic events have caused major changes in the workforce landscape. And you have to remember, this isn't just a labor shortage, it's a labor shift. Some of the industries that are having the hardest time bringing employees back, leisure and hospitality, home health care workers, child care workers, small mom and pop retail businesses. Well, think back a year and a half. Those are the same businesses that laid off millions and millions of people. Lots of those people aren't sitting at home. They shifted into other industries completely. Think about Walmart, Target, Amazon. Those big box stores have hired millions of people to their distribution centers, and they're looking to hire more. And those are jobs that offer less one-on-one -on -one contact, which is a concern for people worried about COVID. They often pay more, and they offer benefits. So when you couple those things together, there's been a big labor shift, as well as people who are now working from home. There's more virtual jobs out there. And do not forget, COVID is not behind us. People have child care issues and health concerns. Hmm. Another big way the world has changed during the pandemic. So interesting, Steph. Thank you very much. We can move on now. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube. So some of that information, um, especially the great resignation, I'm sure several of you have already heard about. But what I want to point out is outside of those who um, unfortunately lost their um, jobs due to the pandemic um, based on the industry, whether it was, um, you know, restaurant worker, hospitality, et cetera, um, I think that this has also been a huge moment for most Americans to really reflect on what is important in terms of their work lifestyle, um, whether you are juggling, you know, being a parent or whether you are juggling, you know, other priorities or um, commitments in life. But people are having a better time in terms of understanding who, who they are and what type of work lifestyle aligns with them. And a lot of employers are having to take notice of this shift um, and think about, you know, are there ways that they can adapt where there's more harmony in terms of the employees and also being able to get the work done?
And we can go on to the next slide. So some of the impact that the video talked about was um, just staffing challenges with so many individuals you know, resigning. Um, there's increased demands for businesses that are growing. And then from my area of uh, career centers where we work with students and alumni to help them seek work and internships, there has been, there's been a decline that we've noticed at our hiring events. Um, we haven't been able to do as many traditional career fairs. We've done virtual ones, but we're taking a look at shifting some of our models and you know, being um, aware of some of the trends that have caused us to re now that we need to start rethinking what we're doing. Um, next slide, please. So all that to say why we're here today <laughs> for exploring, you know, portfolio careers um, with everything that's happened in the 19, you know, plus months with the pandemic, with, you know, us just being aware that we have so many different interests and there, the world of work is shifting so quickly and changing rapidly. Um, the notion of having to pick one particular um, area is just not reality. And so for me, more than ever, I felt that the portfolio career conversation is important during, um, especially where we are in terms of looking at all of our skills and not putting all our eggs in one basket and having, you know, um, uh, this understanding that, you know, your field of work or your uh, particular position may or may not be around in the future, or your interests may change and you may not feel fulfilled with something that you originally picked, but that's okay. You have these other areas that you can find where you can either find, you know, part-time work or freelance work, or, you know, you can be a consultant. And in fact, a lot of educators um, are using um, outside of teaching or being professors or for someone like me outside of being you know, uh, managing a career center, being a career counselor, we could do consulting work, um, we could use our skills. If I think about all of the skills that I've gained in my work, you know, I do event planning, I do marketing, I do employer relations, that is similar to some of the recruiting work. Um, I have teaching skills, I have training skills, I have supervisory skills. So those are all transferable skills. Um, and then looking at, you know, whether a portfolio career is right for you, where you have um, multiple streams of income rather than finding just one job that might pay all the bills. There's definitely some pros and cons, the life situation type of, you know, you have, it's, there's no right or wrong answer. It's kind of a very individual based on your lifestyle. So for the next slide, um, some of the pros and cons that I would like to share with you to think about if this makes sense, where you have multiple streams of income coming from different, um, jobs or different opportunities versus just one. So some of the pros might be that you might have freedom in terms of choosing how you work, whether it's um, remote or in person, but also freedom in terms of your hours that you choose to work, flexibility on the days or the time of the day that you want to work, having more control. So, um, you know, if you want to be able to spend more time either, you know, at home with your family, or you want to spend more time on your own physical health or mental health, or, you know, rather than working, you know, 50, 60 hours a week, like these are all individual type of questions that you have to see based on where you are in your life. And then making work meaningful. So it has to be more than just a paycheck. It has to be something that, um, you know, we may not all love everything about our work, but there has to be a greater purpose and meaning as to why you're doing it. And if you're not able to answer that, then that's a good time to reflect and um, take a moment to think about some of the questions that we looked at in terms of values. And then the cons that could come with portfolio doesn't mean that this is guaranteed is financial uncertainty. So based on where you are in your life, if you are the sole, um, uh, you know, maybe you aren't uh, married or have a partner that can, um, have health benefits for both of you. So it might be risky at this time in your life where you are to um, get a couple of different jobs that may not provide the benefits that you need. Um, the unpredictability of, you know, if you have to, you don't know what next month's paycheck might look like versus having a job where you know you're making, there's consistent, um, 
like salary in terms of you knowing what you're going to make. And then you have to find self-discipline within yourself. So you won't have anyone else getting you all pumped up and motivated to do the work. You yourself have to be responsible for that. And then just again, your own life circumstances. You may be in your life right now where you might be able to take more risk. Um, you, you might have the means to do that, or you might be in a situation where you have a mortgage and you're providing for your family. Um, and so, you may not be able to commit to something right away. Something else to consider, Era, is that there are part-time opportunities where you can get health benefits. Um, for example, adjunct faculty at our campus or you know, any college campuses, um, after you've worked consistently for a couple of semesters, you are eligible for health benefits. I know that there are certain employers that allow for that. Um, and then the other piece that I wanted to share is that you could also have a full-time job and I know it sounds like you're working all the time, but um, some people are like, you know, doing maybe DJing or somebody like Jacoby who might like music, but you, you find something that maybe you don't have to commit to like every weekend, but maybe it's once a month that it allows you to um, not only align, you know, use that interest to make you happy and feel fulfilled, but also make some money on the side. So. Um, in closing, I wanted to share, you know, my own personal experience with just this idea of portfolio careers. So when I was getting my master's in career counseling is when I first heard about portfolio careers, because I had a lot of anxiety of where I was going to work. It wasn't that I felt like I would have a hard time finding a job, even though we were just coming out of a recession, but it was more of, will I be happy? Will I, will this really fulfill me? And so I started thinking about all these other types of opportunities and work that would make me excited. But reality, I was limited in time. And how was I, how was I going to do all of this? And so what I've started to look at is not feeling like I have to fulfill all of my interests in um, my career, like my happiness in everything at once, but finding uh, ways that I can, for example, I, I shared earlier that I'm an aspiring entrepreneur, right? So I don't have a business right now, but I'm looking at, you know, ways that I can connect and stay committed to some of the things that I'm really passionate about. And, you know, the rec is wonderful resource to have. So even being involved and in learning about that, even though I may not have my business right now on the side to start with. Um, and I think that just knowing that, you know, the rest of your life, how you um, go through your career development or your just, you know, your journey of choosing different careers. Um, there's, there doesn't have to be one perfect path. There's different ways to evolve and pivot. So I hope that that was helpful. Um, and then I think that's the closing. I, next slide, I think it's just questions. So um, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And you know, yeah, I was gonna say, you know, you're very welcome at the rec for anything. And, and the same goes for everyone. Uh, you know, come to the workshops and, and we hope that we can be supportive in helping all of you to, um, you know, find find those careers that, that match with uh, what's on the inside. Uh, and and for, for many of us, it's not about finding it, but about creating it, right? From scratch when it doesn't exist, so. Thank you. That was that was wonderful, Mona. Thank you. So um, questions from everybody. Questions for Mona. And we'll also share in the uh, in the chat. Uh, I want to share our uh, website. So if anybody does want to learn more. Uh, Mona, I have a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. um, how often do people change careers? in in their lifetime do you, just as a, a curiosity yeah and yeah. Is, it, is it more now than it used to be too the, sorry. the statistics are constantly changing and i'm very curious to see how the pandemic is going to shift um because of all the trends so i would say i've heard any anywhere from like nine to twelve in the past but um i think that because more people are having like the portfolio type of lifestyle where they might have one like primary, like based career, and then they're getting side income from other like consulting, um, 
it I don't know how they count that into the changes of picking up those sort of almost these side gigs. So it would be really interesting to see that, but it's definitely becoming more common to pivot, shift, um, and find multiple ways of, you know, aligning your different skill sets in different fields. Yeah, I can't wait to see that data. I really, I, I'm excited to, to, you know, to see how it's changed. I have a feeling it's it's going to be a lot shorter in between in between pivots um, mm -hmm. now. So. Awesome. So other questions from, oh, sorry, Angela, I didn't mean to. I had one more question. I'm sorry. <laughs> so if you had someone who was pivoting into a different career path, what one piece of advice would you give them? The one piece of advice that I would give them is um, I'm all about taking risks, but do it strategically and don't leave, um, always leave gracefully. <laughs> So that means that, you know, if this door is closing now, but for any reason you have to, you know, potentially come back or have that opportunity, because I think that we have to be practical to a certain degree of, you know, understanding our lifestyles and just, you know, income is having steady income is something that a lot of us are familiar with. And so when all of that changes, um, it's, it's important to think it thoroughly and talk to people about it um, before you completely shift right away. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> I just right. wanted to say, I thought this was a really great presentation because I know a lot of people, um, they get locked into this, this mindset of one, only wanting to have or only thinking they can have one career choice or one type of job. So I'm glad that you went over um, being having what was it called having a a, portfo a portfolio, portfolio career portfolio. or multiple yeah. multiple streams of income basically so you can make money off of things that you're passionate about on the side you know and just um you know personally I would say to people that you should just try everything you know like I know a lot of people especially like me like a couple years ago I'm thinking like oh I have to I have like I have to be a marketer <laughs> like that's it you know but then I just but then I realized like you can dip into other things, you know, like you got to just try it. You got to just, you know, just take a risk, calculate a risk. So, yeah. And also that if you do get this one job, understand that there's ways that you can use some of your skills that you can introduce something new, for example, in education, like, you know, you, Tanya, I mean, great example, entrepreneur <laughs> right there, like, yeah. You know, maybe teaching is she she did she might not want to be boxed in with just her teaching skills, but she's using all of these other skills. So, you know, that could almost be like a portfolio career. You do have a portfolio career, I think, Tanya. Yeah, I agree. I always uh, I, I feel like I'm an entrepreneur, like not an entrepreneur necessarily in this in this field, but an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. uh, starting companies within the the structure of um, you know of the of the bureaucracy that I may not feel to totally uh, comfortable with or at home. Uh, so yeah, the things I, I agree with you on that one. Right. And when something gets boring or you don't feel excited about, that's a good sign that it's time. And, you know, I've been saying, I love what I do, but out loud, I've been saying like, I'm not, I'm tenured, which is wonderful. And I feel blessed and I feel grateful that I have, you know, this job and I get to meet with students, but I know in terms of life is short, and if I wake up tomorrow and I haven't tried these other, you know, career paths, then I don't want to look back and feel bad. So, you know, I, I don't see myself working in higher ed until I retire and that's okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So do we have any other questions um, from the audience? So if, if we give a pause, let people answer. So if not, um, I, I do want to, uh, share the contact information in case you have any questions if they come to you later uh, so you can reach back out to uh, to Mona or to me and um, we'll go ahead and put that into the chat and um, Mona would you like to uh, leave us with uh, what would you like to leave the audience with to take away um, in terms of my contact information or no no I mean just, just a thought whatever you'd like to leave the uh, the the 
you know, leave us uh, with one final thought to, to think as we move forward with our week. Yeah, if I could just share that, um, I think, you know, a lot of you naturally are going to be interested in many areas. And timing wise, you might not feel like you can do it all at once. But just know that over time, be remind yourself of what gets you excited, those core values, your interests, like, there's ways to use all of that to find fulfilled lives. And um, you can pivot, you can redefine yourself. Um, we all evolve, we all change. I mean, how I was in my 20s versus 30s, and now in my 40s, so much of us has changed, I have more wisdom. So um, just welcome that change and adapt and just be open to possibilities. And you don't have to have that perfect job title, that perfect major, think in terms of skills, building skills and adapting those in different ways. So that would be kind of a summary of what I would share. Thank you so much, Mona. That's a, a great, great thing to leave it with. And um, thank you all for coming for, for all of, um, you know, all of your uh, support of the rec for since the beginning. And uh, I just really one last thing want to encourage everybody fill out the survey. It's available in the chat. And if you'd like to watch this recording, it'll be available starting tomorrow on our YouTube channel. You can just go to YouTube and type in the Rec Innovation Lab. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Mona. And we will see you again at the next workshop. Bye, everyone. Thank you.